Okay, we're recording. So this is great. We're able to record the, the session now. So let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. And then I will screen share and we can begin our, our discussion as we conclude the Lord's Prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you again today. We just want to lift you up. We want to give you glory and praise. We want to honor you in all that we do and say. We ask forgiveness of our sins, and we thank you so much for the blood of Jesus, which covers us all. Father God, I just pray as we study your word, as we finish studying the Lord's Prayer, that we would really grow in grace, that we grow in our understanding, that our prayer life would grow. I pray that each one of us would pray more often to you. We'd also listen more often through your word and listen for your voice. And as the Lord's Prayer states, we want to do your will. We want your will to be done. It's in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, everyone can see that. Just raise your hand or say something if you if you cannot if you can't see this. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to finish the Lord's prayer. I have I have a, a blank, uh, a blank screen again with the text, and we're going to continue our study and discussion, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to. I have some conclusions that I want to share with you, and then maybe after the class, I can send you those conclusions. So I, I don't want to share everything with you up front. So let's go back and let's just continue studying the Lord's Prayer. We, we moved on. There was a series of commands here. In verse 5, there was a prohibition. In verse 5, there was a prohibition against not being like hypocrites when we pray. That is to say, not praying to be seen of others, looking for the praise of, of men, but, but being sincere in our prayer life, genuine. Verse 6 calls us to pray in secret, and we discussed how what that looks like and how that doesn't mean that we can never pray in public. But as a rule of thumb, our focus should be uh, praying and speaking to God in private, and then in the future, he's going to reward us. And so that's verse number 6. Verse number seven then was a discussion, uh, several commands on not praying like the heathen or the Gentiles or unbelievers. And so we discussed how the, 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 our prayer life should not have vain repetition. It needs to come from a genuine heart. We're speaking to God. And we also discussed how we, the, whole, the whole context surrounding these vain repetitions is that through, the, through the, the Gentile, through the unbelievers' e effort to pray over and over and over again in, rep in repetition and, and repeating themselves, that their God or the God or a God would hear them. So the whole point is that if you do all this effort in praying over and over and over again, the God is going to, to, to hear you. And Jesus says, don't, don't be like them. Your Father already knows what you what you need. And then it's in, in this context in which we are to pray. And so we discussed how we discussed how this is really this forms the basis. This then forms the basis for um, our pattern of prayer. Okay? The fact that the fact that God knows, the fact that God knows. And so we discussed a little bit about God's foreknowledge. And also how Matthew shows us that God's word is 
being fulfilled especially the bad circumstances. Okay, so we just briefly touched on that and, and I can, I'll, I think I sent, I'm preparing a handout for this to send you, but throughout Matthew's gospel, bad events occur in Jesus's life. And, and the greatest bad event is this crucifixion. But, but in actuality, Matthew is saying, no, 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 no. That's ordained by God. The scriptures must be fulfilled. All this happened in order that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And it isn't simply a passive, the scripture predicts an event, meaning it looks down and sees the event and then predicts it. it, it the sense is that the scripture is is ordaining the event. It's, it's saying, this is what will happen, and then it happens. And so you see that in God speaking, and then the word fulfill. The word fulfill literally means to fill up, or for something uh, to be full. And so the idea being that when the word of God is spoken, that has to come into reality, okay? So we can discuss that later. Um, the, the point of emphasizing emphasis here is that if we know that God is in control, if he knows what we have need of, we talked about this, it frees us up from, from worrying, from immediately giving our requests. We can focus on our worship of God because God already knows what we need. So it's in that context then that we're commanded to pray. And so then the first, the first, uh, thing that we're to, to, to pray is hallowed be your name or we talked about how this can be uh, reworded uh, a request to exalt or separate your name and your name includes Your name includes both, both the Father and the Son. And we're gonna actually come back to this to this to this later. Okay. And then the next the next command is is your kingdom come. And we talked about we talked about this in the present. the kingdom coming in the present and also in the future. So my question, my question as way of review, as we were discussing, uh, I've gone back and forth on this. On this um, um, I, I was thinking about what, what Ray talked about, about how there are, uh, about the kingdom coming in the present. And I do think the accent is upon the future. But there is, there is some sense in which we can pray for the king, kingdom to come in the present. And what are the specific aspects of the kingdom? We mentioned these last time. What are the specific aspects that we can pray for for the kingdom to come now uh, before Christ returns? What are some things, what are two things specifically that we can be praying for in the present? There may be others. I'm thinking of two. I'm not going to continue until i hear from you what are what are some you could give me something in the present or something in the future what, what does this idea your kingdom come what are we praying for precisely anyone want to give some input according to the, the last uh, discussion that we had about this um it was mentioned that about the confidence that we have right now at the present that's okay so I'm yeah okay so 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 we talked about um confidence mm -hmm. so so that's a general term which is good so what are some some specific things what are some specific components of the of the kingdom now 
that would give us this confidence. So I agree with you. I agree with you, Dexter, that it, that there's confidence now. So I want to know what specific, what's what specifically, what what part of the kingdom now gives us this confidence or brings this confidence? Anyone, if if not Dexter. It's raining now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So go ahead. So, so Bethany, what did you say? He's already raining here on Earth. Well. No. Uh, yes and no. Yeah. So, so no. So, so Bethany talked about Jesus's reign, which I agree. Uh, correct me. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it would be what what passage of scripture is the strongest passage of Jesus's reign in Matthew? What's the passage? Strongest passage. Matthew 28. Yes, Matthew 28. Correct. Matthew 28, 18. And this is saying all authority in heaven and earth. <laughs> heaven and earth. So, Bethany, you are correct in referring to his reign on earth. We don't see the reign in the fullness. So, so there is a future component to this reign that we don't see yet. But, but all authority has already been given, has already been given to, 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 to Jesus on heaven and earth upon his ascension. So that's great. That's a great, um, when we're, uh, that, that's something that's already occurred in the present. And we're, we're, what we, what, when, so when we say your kingdom come, we're talking about, about, uh, about Jesus using his authority on earth. So we can pray for how can Jesus' authority be used on earth now? How about, how about binding of binding of Satan and his demons. Dominion. Right? Matthew 12 talks about Christ binding Satan. The, 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 Satan is already, now he's not, there's a sense in which he's bound, and yet there's a sense in which he still has activity in the world. But nonetheless, we, so, so when we pray for, for demonic forces to be cast out, when we're praying that, that for protection from demonic forces, we're praying that Jesus would exercise his authority over these forces of evil. Okay? So that is a component of the kingdom in the present. Okay? How else? What else in the present? So what one component of this confidence is Jesus' reign. What is another? What is another? We talked about it. It it should Am I going to have to say it? Did we talk about it in the in the earlier Last verses? Week. No, what we, we, what we talked what we talked about it in the later verses and also in this uh -huh. verse. So I'm, are you, oh, go ahead, someone. Are you talking about the descriptive and prescriptive? No. <laughs> okay. Well, so connected with it. Well, yeah. So yes and no. Um, but oh, the, oh, about the lead us not into temptation. Well, it's, yeah. I'm just gonna say it's kind of, it's kind of all over here. Uh, no, but the but the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is uh, the Holy Spirit is a component of the kingdom on earth now. His work. Does everyone see that? The work of the Holy Spirit. Everyone tracking with me there, or do we need to go to a passage? Is that making sense, or do you want to go to a passage just to kind of lock it down? Someone 
I'm not, I'm seeing blank faces, so I don't. We've been in lockdown for too long. Okay, we're not locking down. Okay, <laughs> if you if if you want uh, the, the 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 passage, uh, let's just go there. I, I'm gonna, let's just go there and then really quick. So let's go to Matthew chapter twelve. So I'm just going to read this quickly. Everyone can see this right here. Okay. Uh, verse 25. Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. No city or house divided against itself will stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? But if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Okay? So a, a component of the coming of the kingdom, a huge component, is the Spirit of God. That's what gives us confidence. If God's Spirit is inside us, if God's Spirit is, is controlling demonic forces around us, there is already a sense in which God's kingdom is present. So it should give us huge confidence. What about now future? What about future? I mean, there are others, but that's just kind of a, a springboard. If you have another, you can add. But what are, when, we are, when we're praying, your kingdom come, let's be more specific. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to be more specific because this will help us in our prayer. Because remember, this is a pattern. This is not word for word, for, for, but a pattern. So it's going to get old, praying the same thing over and over again. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, to, to pique your interest. I'm trying, I'm trying to create, I'm trying to expand what's already here in, uh, in uh, kernel form. I want it to expand into a popcorn. <laughs> Go the, so what specifically can we pray about with uh, the future? What else can be the, the rule of uh, Jesus in our heart? Okay, so okay, so th that will be a present. That's a present now because right now Jesus is ruling in our hearts, right? So let's we can we can we can add we can add here. So so and this is good. So another now is uh, Jesus is. Can I just change your word? Uh, lordship. Jesus's lordship over us okay is that okay jesus is lordship over us and this is uh this is heart and actions okay it's not enough just to have it in the heart that has to come in actions the actions is not enough if it's not in the heart. You see what I'm saying? It has to be both. It has to be both. Okay? All right? So, great observation, Kuya Danny. So, side by side. So, it's uh, simultaneous uh, in the head and the heart. Yes, both. Both must be present. Yeah. And if it's in the heart, if it's truly in the heart, if we have... If we have submitted to the reign of God, to, to, to the reign of Jesus in our heart, it's going to come out. Guaranteed it's going to come out. Okay. Um, future. I'm looking for future. How else can we, what are we thinking about? I want, I want, this is practical here, okay? Your kingdom come. The um, other people will be, the unbelievers will finally realize, uh, will be uh, convicted that they, Jesus has, uh, they have uh, trusted Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Okay, so, so, um, yeah, I mean, evangelism is more, uh, okay, so, uh, people are open to the gospel. Okay, so let's, so let's add two, so let's add two categories here, Kui Danny. Let's add, Let's add in, in uh, believers.
And then also in, uh, in unbelievers, unbelievers uh, repenting and believing. Isn't it in the future, Tim? Okay, so it, okay, so okay. Maybe this is my this is my confusion here. Uh, believing the gospel. Okay. Okay. Let me just draw a quick diagram, and maybe this is helpful here. Okay. So so let me just draw a quick diagram here. So if you're looking at time here, okay. Um. This is the cross, right? And so now this is the, the church, right? Okay. So, so, there, so uh, um, when we're talking about the future, okay, um, this is essentially the present, okay? This is essentially, we're talking about the present, this age. Maybe let me, let me, let me, let me, let me talk about this age. But it's, it's things that are happening now. So, of course, tomorrow someone else will come to the Lord. But, but uh, in this age, during this time period, during the, the period of... Before, yeah, okay. I, that's where I'm going to it. So, so you, have, you have this present age, okay? In this present age... The Lord right now is reigning in heaven and on earth. We, we are trusting in him. We're submitting to him. We're, the Satan is, is, is bound and being bound. The demons are being bound. Um, that's the present. When I'm referring to the future, we're looking at, you can talk about the eternal, the eternal state and events ushering this in okay I, I don't know if that makes sense there's a lot more diagrams that we can draw i'm just what i'm trying to get at is what i'm referring to the future is what's the next big event that we're praying to be to be brought about is what i'm trying to say and so bethany uh gave the answer well no i was just trying to help you s describe what pre the present yes. age is the yes, present yes. age is the age up until christ returns yes yes I wasn't saying that. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. You guessed it. So it's that's what I was trying to get. What I was trying to get us. So what I'm trying to get here is to to the specific future thing that we're praying for is the return of the Christ. Okay. So when when we pray, Your kingdom come. I mean, we're praying that God that Jesus' reign will be realized. That people would submit to Jesus' reign. That the Spirit would work. But we're also praying that Jesus would return. Is everyone tracking with me there? Everyone there with me? Good. Okay. And is it okay to add? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, and I think this is if we will not take the first half of the prayer, it focus on the Father. Yeah. Because it's more of his agenda. Yes. The prayer that he he wants us to have is more of his agenda, not ours. Yes. <laughs> no. in the first, in the in the first half if you will notice it's more on um uh, the father knows already yeah. <laughs> what we want to ask but but first we should acknowledge that the father is the one who can give that that to us Am I right? <laughs> yes. No. We're gonna go there. So, so Ati Grace, you're stealing my thunder. That's really good. You, you, no, because okay, okay. no, but but you're tracking with me. These are really focused on. I I like what you're saying. I like what you're saying that these are focused on God or or God's agenda. I, I'm gonna write that down. Uh, um, uh, 
up until here, right? Yeah. That's good. This is really uh, the father's agenda. And it, it ends that way too. It goes back to that at the end. Yes, okay. So Bethany's saying it goes back at the end. Now here's the thing, and, and, and we're all guilty, and I'm guilty of this, okay? But our prayers are our prayers can be very narcissistic. <laughs> Narcissistic uh, self is self-centered. They're, uh, they're focused on us and our needs. And I, I really like what you're saying, Ati Grace, that the, the, first, uh, the first several components of the Lord's Prayer are God-centered, the Father-centered, uh, other-centered, not ourselves, okay? Not our needs, not the needs of those around us, but, but our Heavenly Father. And, and I think we all fall into this trap. We all fall guilty of, Everything becomes about us and man, and we really lose sight of who the Father is and what His agenda is. So I really, I really like that. I mean, that's a that's Magalinka. That's a good. That's a good. Uh, that's really nice there. So thank you, Ati Ati Grace. So uh, yes, uh, just to, to finish up here, when we pray, um, and I want us to chat. I want I want to challenge us here. Are we, are we praying for the return of Christ? Are we praying for the return of Christ? Um, that really means that we have this eternal focus. We're not focused in the here and now. If, if, if our desire and passion is for the return of Christ, uh, that's really an eternal perspective. That's, that's a perspective that's centered on the will of God. Okay, so that transitions, as, that transitions us to the third, the third component. So we have, we have uh, the exaltation of the name of uh, the exaltation of the name of the Father and the Son. We have the prayer for. Uh, now I I I I'm going to change this here. Um, uh, I have. I'll come back to that later. <laughs> later but we have we have this prayer for for christ to return for the kingdom to come the kingdom is present in some sense so we can talk about the king, kingdom to come in its fullness the, the kingdom to to come in its consummation um uh, but we're, we're praying for 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 the for for everything to be consummated n number three number three your will be done your will be done that is such a a request for the will of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is such a a knife in our heart because we're always praying for our will. <laughs> we're always we're, we're we're asking for confirmation for our for our will for my will for God. I want to do this. Is that okay with you? <laughs> it's like. I want to do this. Are, do you approve? We, we really, how often do we pray for God's will to be done? That, that's really, uh, that's hard. It's hard to do. Now, I want to ask the question here. I want to ask the question here. The question that I want to ask here is, what is the will of God? What is the will of God? Before you answer specifically, where would we go to try to find out where the answer is? Someone. Uh, Lola Dong, you're muted. Can you unmute? Yeah, I think uh, we should go all and read the Bible because uh, it's there that uh, it, you know what uh, what uh, God is telling us. It's there. When yeah. I say when you say that, uh, uh, let me let me digest this thing. When you first uh, the very first uh, uh, verses of the 
I mean the prayer mismo. Uh, you say that uh, uh, our Father, right? It's yeah. uh, actually accepting the Father in heaven. Holy be your, hallowed be your name. That is also accepting that uh, He is really holy. Yeah. Okay. So this is the prayer, and the prayer is a petition actually. Yeah. And the Christ or Matthew is telling us how to pray. How? Yes. And this is what he is saying. First, you have to acknowledge the Father and acknowledge Him to be holy. Yeah. That's what Matthew is, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, oh, okay. Matthew no, so that's, yeah. So, no, so, so what you're saying is, is, are you saying that's part of the will of the Father, that we would acknowledge Him that He is holy? Is, is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, no. for the first, for the first few, uh, the first, the second, is actually acknowledging the Father's sovereignty towards us by saying that, okay, God, you, we accept you as holy. Yeah. Our Father, holy, is your name. Yeah. Yeah. We are accepting that His name is holy to us. And then uh, the next uh, line, what's the next line, please? Can you? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Holy be your name. Your kingdom come. Okay. This is also anticipating what the Bible is saying that uh, there is really a kingdom coming to us and rule over us. Yeah. And that's what Jesus or Matthew is telling us that if we acknowledge the Father's sovereignty, being holy, then his kingdom will be here on earth yes. to uh, reign over us. And uh, we are also praying that his will be done on earth yeah. Yeah. and in heaven. Good. Good. So, 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 so I like what you're saying, Lola Dong. So let's just, I just want to write some of this stuff down. So, so, so specifically, You've just given me some some of the some of the things that are the will of the Father, which which I agree we we should agree that that it's the will of the Father that His name be exalted. Okay, so th those are uh, examples in Matthew. You just gave me examples in Matthew, correct? You just gave me several. So, for example, the ones you gave to me were. Um, um, uh, the name being set apart. How to pray, right? How to pray. That was another reason, uh, example you gave to me. Uh, uh, prayer for the coming kingdom. Those are those are three. Those are three examples of what is the Father's will. Correct, Lola Dom. Yeah. So that that's good. So let's 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 can so let's let's further explore. And I think Lola Dong is giving us a pattern, which which is correct. Is is we need to be looking in Matthew's gospel, Matthew's gospel to define what Jesus, um, to define what, what Jesus views as the will of God, what Matthew views as the will of God, and what the Father himself views as the will of God. And, and, and Lola Dong has given us three, uh, three uh, examples, right? And they're correct. So I, I want us to, to kind of use this as a pattern and, and kind of make a, a bigger umbrella because it's much more than this, but, but this is a good start. So what I want to do is, uh, let's search. <laughs> let's search uh, in Matthew. So I'm going to search in Matthew. Let's uh, let's search in Matthew. Step Bible, our best friend, our big toe. Matthew. And then I want to look up. Let's go to um, let's go to Will. Let's see what we do when we type in Will.
Okay, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, this is too general. I, I don't, I don't like that. So let's, let's make it, let's make it, let's make a fix here. Let's go to Matthew, Matthew 6, not 9 to 13. So I'm just, I'm just showing you how, I'm showing you how I, I would do a search like this. So what I want to do is I want to look up this word. Will slash desire. Okay. So let me, let me try. I want to try to look up this word now. Will. Waiting for it to load. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to go back to Matthew. Now let's see what happens. Maybe we get too many maybe we get too many options. So yeah, it's giving us all the wills. Um let's let's try to make a change here. Um Okay, so I if you if everyone can see this here, if you look here, I changed the word will to desire because when we looked up that Greek word, it said will or desire. So when I changed the word to desire, it's actually giving me the second option in the green says will desire thalema. That's actually the word we want to look up. That'll, that'll limit our search to something much more um, possible. Let me change this here. I'm struggling to just wait on. Will. Desire. I don't know why it's not doing that. Okay, I'm struggling here. <laughs> wait, wait. Um, all right, I'm going to do this in my other Bible program. I got to figure out how to make that work. There is a way. So let's just do Will here. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm, I have to think because when I do my searches, I just do them in Greek. And so I'm having, an, the problem is that it's not, it's, it, the search is too big in English because it's picking up all the, the helping verbs for will. I just want to look up like the, the word will, which is different than like, will you go with me or whatever. So I've already done the search. Let's just go to several passages to help us define. So, so let me, so let, let's just. I'll have to figure out with Step Bible how to make that work, but let's just go to specific passages now. So let me, the first passage we want to go to is Matthew. May I help you? Yeah, go ahead. I think uh, what you're looking for in will, I think that's a desire or intention or want. Yes. Uh, yes. Want. Yeah. yeah, so the, the problem though is that I'm trying to figure out uh, I can, we can do it just in Greek, but we, but you don't know Greek. So when I'm, when I'm looking up will in English, it's giving me all the wills. It's a problem. It's, it's, uh, I, you want to find will in scripture. That's limited to that. That's desire. why, you can't use that's the why word it's not working right now. Yeah. I have to, I have to figure out, there's another option. I have to figure it out and then I'll, I'll explain it later. I don't know if that's making sense. Um, uh, so let's just, let's just go to the first example here. Um, uh, Matthew seven twenty one to 23. Okay, Matthew seven twenty one to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Okay, so right here, um, not everyone <laughs> is going to get in. <laughs> It's specifically limited to, to the will of the Father, okay? So it, when we did a word search, if you did our word search, um, we, this was one example that popped, okay? So 
Um, and then what Lila Dong is saying is a specific category within that will, okay? So here we know that Sigurado, uh, if we're, we're praying, if, if we're praying for the Lord's will to be done, but we're not doing it, we're not going to be in the kingdom, okay? So that's one example, okay? Let's, let's write that down here. There's, there's a method to my madness. Just bear with me. So Matthew 7, 21 to 23. So the praying for God's will of done is very important, and we need to be practicing the will of God, whatever it is, okay? Now, now I would add in 723, not everyone who, who uh, but the one who does the will of my Father and who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So in this context, the will of God seems to be connected with lawfulness. Does everyone see that? The will of God, if someone do, does the will of God, God, he will enter. If he does not do the will of God, he will not enter, okay? And the rejection in verse 23 is lawlessness. So you, we could at least saying, we could at least say that practicing lawfulness or practicing righteousness is, is, is part of this doing the will of, of, of the Father, okay? So I'm just, I'm, I'm giving you um, places to, to investigate. We're not going to really investigate here, but I'm just giving you uh, things to study. All right, let's go to, uh, if you searched it and it worked, we could go then to Matthew, Matthew 11, 26 to 29. Yes, Father, for such was gracious, your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him to. Okay? So it's God's gracious will to give everything to the Son. Everyone sees that? The graciousness of the will of God, his will, is that everything is handed over to Jesus. Okay? So that really places Jesus... What I'm trying to say is we can't say that we, we want the will of God. We can't say that we want, um, we exalt the Father and not embrace the Son. <laughs> Does everyone see that? The two go hand in hand, okay? So this is Matthew 11, 26 to 29. And then Matthew 12, 50. Matthew 12, 50. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, sister, and mother. <laughs> so, so the will of God is so important. We can't call ourselves Christians. We can't call ourselves, we can't pray for God's will to be done if we ourselves are not practicing, okay? And so this goes back to what Danny was saying. The heart, the speech has to agree with the actions, okay? So at this point, again, I'm just, I'm giving us uh, things to explore. So this is Matthew 12, 50. We're going to do two more, and we'll stop here. Um, Matthew 16.23. Excuse me, Tim. Let me... Go ahead, Lola. Yeah, there, is there anything in the Bible that uh, specifically uh, gives something of the will of the Father? Uh, so that if we are going, for example, that... Uh, we Christians are going to follow the will of the Father. What really is the will of the Father? Is there anything in the Bible that says uh, this is the will of the Father? Yeah. So we have to follow them. 
Yeah, no, great question. So Lola Dong is what is the specific, so what is the specific will? Do we have just a precise? And so um, my answer is yes, there is. And so uh, part of this study though is I, I, um, I, I'm trying not just to give you the answers. I'm trying to, to kind of open up how we would go about finding the answer and then we get to the answer, okay? So, so the, the short question is, is, is yes. Right now we're seeing different components of, of how important the will of the Father is, who, uh, who's in, who's out, all these different connections here. So um, I'm gonna give the answer, it's, it's coming up in two verses, okay? So uh, Matthew 16, 23, Matthew 16, 23, let's go, let's go there, Matthew 16, 23. Matthew 16, 23. But he turned and said to Peter, so this is right after the declaration of, this is right after the declaration of, of who Jesus is. And then, he, and then Peter rebukes him. And then he says, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but the things of man. Okay, and so this is in the context of going to the cross when Jesus, right after Jesus says, I'm going to go and suffer and die and be raised again. And so uh, a, specific, a specific component of the will of God is the, the crucifixion. Okay, Let, let's, go to the last, let's go to, to the last passage here. And there's many more passages here that we could go to. Let's go to Matthew 17, 5. Matthew 17, 5. This is the transfiguration. This is the transfiguration. And listen to what, uh, after Jesus is transfigured, and then the disciples come, and I believe it was, oh, I think maybe it was Peter, he says, I'll make three tabernacles. <laughs> I'll make three tabernacles for Moses, Elijah, and you. And then, the, listen to this, verse 5. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. <laughs> and so the short answer, the short answer is, uh, is God's will is unknown to us unless he reveals it to us. Looking back at Matthew 11, he says, everything has been given to the son. And then in 17.5, he says, this is my beloved son, listen to him, okay? And so a, a fundamental component of the will of God is us listening to the words of Jesus. And so Lil Dong, you gave specific examples, how we pray, exalting the name. Those, those are specific examples in the context of listening to the son, okay? So everything the Son commands of us is the will of the Father. <laughs> you see? Um, um, and so if, 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 we're, if we're saying that everything has been given to the Son, um, praying for the will of God to be done is really big picture in Matthew. It's, it's Paul says this multiple times reconciling all things to himself through his son Recon reconciling all things through himself uh uh to himself through the son so 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 again it's it's coming to it's coming to um does someone want to say something i think we already just arrived Okay.
so so this so this is that's the big one if, if we're going to get very specific let, let's go really quick here to ephesians <clears throat> Okay, uh, I'll come back there. Let's go to Ephesians really quick. Ephesians. Ephesians 1. Okay. Um, so, if you... If, I gave the big perspective in the Gospel of Matthew. This would be the big perspective in Paul or the New Testament or Scripture. So look at this. Verse 8, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. <laughs> okay. So what is the mystery of God's will? According to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, things on earth. If you're looking for a, a very specific little dong, this would be it here. This is the will of God. At the same time, you can say, what is the will of God? Listen to my son. <laughs> Whatever you need to know, listen to him. He's going he's gonna to reveal everything to me. Okay, so in Gospels, Matthew, that, I would really say, I mean, if you want to look at a, a primary text, it would be uh, Ephesians 1, uh, verses 9 and 10. Okay? So, we, so to pray God's will be done, we, we, can, we can pray that the saints would be praying the right way, little dog. We can be praying that we would be exalting his name. That's part of it. We can be praying that all things will be reconciled in Christ on heaven and on earth. Okay? Any questions or comments? Can I, can I make the conclusion that if you want to know the will of the Father, anywhere in the Bible that uh, gets us to the command of Jesus, that is the will of the Father. Yes, exactly. So when you say reconciling ourselves to Jesus Christ, that is the will of the Father, yes. okay? Yes, that's what I want to say. Yeah, good, excellent. Any other comments or questions? It's making sense. In. Grace, <laughs> how is it related to Isaiah 65, the new heavens and new earth? Okay, so let's uh, uh, let's. You said Isaiah 55 or 65? 65, 17 to 25. Okay, let's look here. So Isaiah, you said 65, 17 to 25. Okay, so, so what specifically, just so that, because we, we can go through, what, what specifically is your question? Is your question concerning, um, just maybe, maybe be more precise on your, because this is referring to the, the new heavens and the new earth, right? Yeah, my question is because you've mentioned only to reconcile from heaven and earth in efficient. Yeah. So is this what is saying in this verse in Isaiah? Mm. So is your question because it seems to be it's new and separate, not reconciled? Is that kind of your question? No, it's this. It's more on an affirmation. This is this in what is saying in the Isaiah is an affirmation of what is stated in Ephesians. 
yes, yes, yes. This would this would be connected. This would be um, this would be this would be part of uh, what Ephesians is is referring to. Maybe we can talk about that at the end of class. Let's let's talk more about <laughs> because I'm not I'm not I'm not, yeah, I'm, not, I'm, not good. I'm not really tracking with your, your question and um th there's a lot of uh um issues because anyway so so um there is there is a there is a connection there's different passages that really kind of connect them but um it's a it's a long it's a long time to answer. So maybe we can do that at the end of class because it's already four o'clock. I do want to finish today. I want to finish the Lord's Prayer today. So let, let's come back to that. Is that okay, Ati Grace? Okay, okay. Great, okay. So let, let's, I, I really want to finish here. So what we have here is uh, what I, I liked what Ati Grace said. The, the, first, the first three petitions or entreaties or types of, of requests are um, uh, asking for God's name to be exalted, the name of his son, asking for his kingdom to come. I actually had here asked that God would bring a consummation of all things. When his kingdom comes, all those things will, will be consummated um, or brought, brought to conclusion and brought to perfection. And then the third is, uh, is asking for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so um, right now, God's will is being done on earth, but it's not done perfectly. And it's not, not that his will is imperfect, but that, like what we said, all the different commands of Jesus are not being obeyed. Not everyone's listening to Jesus right now. Okay, so we're praying that, that, that more people would listen, more people would obey, more people would submit. When Christ returns, God's will will be done perfectly and completely on earth. Okay, so it's not dealing with the incompleteness or uh, insufficiency of God's will. It's done. It's, it's, it's dealing with the fact that, that um, people are not submitting and it's slowly being brought to, to, to realization. Okay, and it, it will bring, be brought to realization uh, completely at the return of Christ. Okay, and there's, there's other issues concerning um, well, God's ordaining of different events, which are all perfect. <laughs> I don't want to go into all that stuff. We can discuss that after class or, or, or another time. Um, but I just want to give us direction on what the will of God is, how we can pray for it to be accomplished, when will it be accomplished, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's go on to uh, verse number eleven. So, so now we have. Now we have, whereas the first three is focused on God's agenda, the last three are focused on, on our needs or our agenda, right? So we have, we have this uh, command here to um, uh, provide for our daily bread. And without going into um, a lengthy discussion, I mean, we could say daily bread is... Daily bread we can rewrite as daily needs. For them, the daily needs were food, but of course, for us, it's more than food. The daily necessities are, are what we need daily to live, and so um, it's more than just bread, literally. Right? So we, Philippine context, maybe give us this day our daily conan, <laughs> right? So, uh, <laughs> But, but the idea there is that it's, it's what we need daily to live. So it could be water, it can be food, it can be clothing. We see towards the end of chapter six, the need for us for, for clothing. So it's daily necessities, okay? So that would be uh, number one. Number one concerning our agenda now. We're, now we're dealing with our agenda. And then the, the, the next thing I want us to see here is this. Uh, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, this is so difficult. Why is this difficult? What are the issues here? Anyone can talk. Okay. 
Someone want to say something? What is what is challenging here with this with this statement? It's a, it's a really a challenge uh, to forgive people who have offended us. Yeah, so there's a challenge to forgive, yeah. But it's a command. So yeah. we will not be forgiven by Jesus if we don't forgive others. Uh, offense against us. Yeah. Now, now, does this mean that we forgive everyone um, blanket, just a forgiveness blanket? Or is there, is there, is there conditions, is there a context let me ask the question. Is there, is there a context or is there other parts of this uh, command here. Does everyone understand what I'm asking? Or not yet? So here's a question. Does God forgive everyone? No, Big forgive, no, no, answer. Does, no. does God forgive everyone? God no. has forgiven already. Everyone, no, uh, Jesus not. died on the cross. That is Only for those. everyone, but uh, yeah. we need to admit. Okay, so I think okay, the thing uh, is forgiveness for God is condition conditional in this matter. Okay, so so I hear Ray. I hear the voice. Where is he? Where, where, Ray, where are you? <laughs> You're hiding. I, I'm here. I'm here. I just didn't turn my 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 video because oh good okay so. I did not okay so. So, okay, so, so, um, Ray says there's, let's, let's start a new thing here. Um, okay, so Ray, Ray had said that there were, that, that God's forgiveness is conditional. I think, Danny, you were saying that God forgives everyone on the cross. Um, uh, Dexter, were you saying something? Yeah, I was saying the same. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I think the, 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 the way I understand it, Tim, is that as far as salvation, it's available for everybody, but forgiveness itself is based on how we respond to that salvation it's being offered by God so yeah so so let let's 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 take a look at this let's take some time maybe maybe we won't finish today I hope that we do I do I do want us to explore this because um, um, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, I, I think for me it's been for me in studying this and understanding this there's a lot of different components when 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 and this is why to go deeper is so important we have to understand forgiveness and what's being because this is this is a huge let's just put this this is this is a huge this is huge here um this is this is so serious if we don't forgive um god won't forgive us because later after the prayer it says if we don't forgive god won't forgive us and so we we're like you know, so we have to number one understand what does God, what, how does God forgive, and how do we forgive, and what's required in forgiveness, and and um, we have to. There's there's a lot of details that we have to understand because number one, we want to obey the command, but number two, we want to be faithful to what we're called to do. Okay, so what I have here is I just have some a definition. Let's just work through this. We might we might not get to it all today. I, I don't want to belabor this. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to rush through this because this is such an important concept, especially since we are to be called to engaged in it. We are. We are, we are asking forgiveness of our sins, 
and we we are um, we are also should be asking forgiveness from others. Okay, now um, let's just go to a very um, uh, um, let's go to one very very common text. Let's go to First John one nine. Let's go to First John one nine just to kind of set the table. <laughs> going to set the table here. Uh, first John 1 9. First John 1 9. I'll call on someone to read now that we're uh, we're using this uh, this other just because it's easier it's easier to would someone like to read? You can either read from your Bible or um, uh, from the from the screen. Does someone want to read that for me? First John one nine. First John one nine. Beth, how about you? Can you read it? Can you read it? Yeah, I've been there. Beth, you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, so there is forgiveness conditioned upon what? There's a condition there, right? There's a condition. What is the condition? Confession. We confess our sins. Confession. There should be a confession. Condition. Uh, there must be a confession before forgiveness. So before God can forgive our sins, we have to confess. Okay? All right? So going back to the prayer... This implies we have to be confessing. So us just praying, forgive us our sins, not enough. Not enough. We are to confess our sins. Okay? Simply saying, forgive us our sins, is not enough. What is implied, what is implied there is confession. We see that in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us of our sins. So here, we're asking God to forgive us of our sins. Fair enough. But the full context, the broader context that we, that we should be doing is confessing our sins. And so to confess our sins literally means to declare what we've done. So I have sinned in being angry with my wife. I have sinned in disrespecting my authority. I have sinned in looking at pornography. I have sinned in lusting after a car. I have sinned in uh, coveting my neighbor's Hilux. <laughs> okay? So we need to be, the implication here is we need to be confessing our sins, not saying, Father, I'm sorry, I've had a bad week. Not a confession. Not a confession. Okay? So, so that's the first thing. Okay, let's let's continue here. Let's let's look let's look here at uh, Ephesians. Ephesians four thirty-two. Ephesians four thirty-two. Ephesians 4.32. Would someone else like to read? Yeah, I can read. Go ahead, Dexter. <clears throat> Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Okay. 
Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. So if if we understand that within the context of forgiveness, there is a component of confession. That in, that in, that uh, implied in the forgiveness is that our brother is confessing their sin. Okay, <laughs> okay. So be kind, tender-hearted one to another, forgiving as God in Christ forgave you, okay? Um, God in Christ, let's break this down here, okay? Uh, um, God in Christ forgave you. Does God forgive every person? Now, now I think, and we, we all, so, so I'm, not, I'm not in any way calling out anybody or anything, but I mean, the offer is there for anyone who will receive it, okay? But the forgiveness is, is, is conditioned upon in Christ. This here implies union with Christ. So God doesn't forgive the world. He forgives the world for those who are in Christ. Okay? Romans 5.1 declares, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Up until Romans 5, there is no peace. We're under the wrath. God's wrath is coming against our impenitent heart. And it's not until we are justified by faith being in Christ, that we now have peace with God. So, so although this offer is offered to Jew and Gentile, okay, it's offered, but the forgiveness is not given. God does not forgive. Hence, his wrath is poured out on all those who do not confess and commit to Jesus. Does everyone see, everyone tracking with me? So, so, um, so that's the first that is so important. God forgives us in Christ. And when it, when it says that God forgives us, again, looking at John 1, 9, it's, it's conditioned upon the fact that we have already confessed our sins, turned, repented of our sins, and put our faith and trust in Jesus. And then God forgives us, okay, in time and space. All right? Is that, does, that, does everyone under, understand that here? So, so coming, so we're going to include... We're going to include, we're going to include, um, uh, this concept forgiving one another as, okay? So again, this is, this is, Im this is implying confession. That someone, that our brother or sister has confessed, has confessed their sin and have, has turned from that lifestyle and is asking for us to forgive, okay? And the reason why this is so important is because there are specific commands concerning unrepentant, unconfessing Christians. But let's go to, to Ephesians I mean, let's go to Corinthians 5, chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 1. I'm just going to read here. You can just follow along and listen, okay? Because if we say that we just forgive blanket, if we just forgive without confession, without repentance, we're going to have a big problem in dealing with church discipline. Dealing with an unrepentant, someone who is refusing to confess what he's doing is wrong, refusing to repent and turn of his sin. If we just say everyone has, we have to forgive everyone regardless of their confession, their repentance, we have a problem when it comes to church discipline. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 5.1. It has actually been reported that there is sexually immor sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in the body, I am present in spirit. So Paul is saying, 
get this brother, remove him. That doesn't sound like a forgiving spirit. Um, uh, it's in the context that there is that they are not repentant, that they are not confessing and turning from their sin. For though absent in the body, I am present in the spirit, and as, it, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who has done such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, my, my spirit is present, the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are really unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but the unleavened bread with sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of the world, or the greedy, or the swindlers, or the idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality, or greed, or is an idolater, a reviler. Reviler is liter literally, reviler is like verbal abuser. Okay? So anyone who is, a sexual, has, is guilty of sexual immorality is a greedy person, is an idolater is a verbal abuser, a drunkard, a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is not those inside the church whom you are to judge. Oh, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. That is incredibly strong. That is incredibly strong. Okay? It's in the context of someone who is unrepentant and not confessing their sin. Okay? Think about that. Ask a question. Let me write this down. Um, we have a couple more passages to go to, but just, just think about that for a minute. If you want to ask a question, you can. Let me write this down here. James? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I just happened to read about this in one of the uh, articles in Desiring God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the article itself, uh, rather the verse itself really is uh, telling us about the question of whether we should judge people or not judge people. So in this particular verse, what I understand in that article is that we have, we have no right to judge people outside of the church, but we yeah. have every right to judge people according to what we see is fit when it comes to the facts or the circumstances that is involved, which is clear. But in things like um, things that we are not really sure about it, we are, we are not really to do that. But in terms of judging people, like in this particular example where it was clear in the church that there was really a problem when it comes to sexual immorality. So we have every right. So the way the way it was presented that is we cannot judge people based on what we just hear or say or uh, told uh, shared to us, but we can judge especially Christians in our church that is that has clear clearly violated the, the standards of God. Yeah. So in that way we can we can still judge people but yeah. in a way, not condemning them, but for correcting them. No, excellent point, Ray. And, and, and it's, it's not judgment meaning to say you're going to hell. It's not judgment saying that God is going to destroy you. It's judgment in the sense of you have done this. You're unrepentant. You're, you're, you're not confessing and turning from your sin. And we're turning you over to Satan and to God. And, 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 and it says here that the flesh will be destroyed so that the spirit can be saved, okay? So even Paul is not pronouncing eternal judgment on the person, but on, on the specific, like you said, it's a clear sin. There, there, there's no speculation. There's no hearsay. It's not, oh, it said this. It was said of this person. It was the person is engaged. It's knowingly engaged, and they're refusing to repent, to confess, and to turn from the lifestyle. And so the command is to remove that person from the presence. 
And here it's more than just the, the sexually immor immoral person. It's the idolater. It's the drunkard. It's the verbal abuser. It's the, it's the greedy person. These are sins that are, people are refusing to change and to turn from. Uh, let, let's go to several other passages so that you see the full context because you, we could just say, okay, we're so unloving. Okay. Let, let's just go to several of the passages to really see the, the full context here. Um, let's go back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Uh, this is concerning offenses. Okay. So this is for church discipline. There's two primary passages, 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, and then also Matthew 15, 18. I would also say that in 2 Corinthians, there seems to be repentance and contrition, and Paul's saying, restore the brother. Bring the, uh, bring the brother back and, uh, um, and, and forgive him. And so even in 1 Corinthians, it's not an ultimate casting aside. It's, it's a casting aside because of lack of repentance and uh, a lack of confession, okay? So the same author, Paul, who says, be kind-hearted to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. That same author says, as a, an apostle of Jesus Christ, remove the lump from among you, okay? So he's saying both, okay? He's saying both. Look at Matthew 15, 18, 15, okay, watch. If a brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. Okay, so this is with Ray. No, no hearsay. Go straight to him, okay? If he does not listen, take one or two others among you, that every charge may be established on the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. So, it, so now it's like, go by yourself, then go with several, then bring it before the church. Okay, so the, the, everyone in the church should know. So, so someone who is engaged in, in, in sin that's refusing to repent, to confess and to repent from the sin, there's no such thing as private sin um, unless he has, he, he has legitimately repented for asking for forgiveness and, 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 and turned, okay? You then bring him, you bring the matter to the church, and the church, what does it say? The ch if he refuses to listen to the church, so the church should be speaking to him, if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. And this is the same word that we saw in Matthew 6, right? Don't speak babble like the, like the heathen, like the Gentiles. So, so in the same sense, you are to treat him like uh, a foreigner, okay? <clears throat> Truly I say to you, whatever is bound, whatever you bind in, on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Okay. Now that's that's the context of casting someone out. Okay. And then we come here, Peter. This is the great. This is the great uh, parable of the forgiveness, right? Peter says, "Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother?" Again, the, the implication is, you know, he's confessed, he's repented. How many times should I forgive? Seven times. And he says, seventy times seven. Okay. And then he gives the parable of the, of the unforgiving servant, okay? Now, look at, look at, we don't have time to read through the unforgiving servant, okay? But look here, verse 26. Uh, after the servant was freed, after he was freed, he goes and finds another servant and grabs him, okay? Look at the heart of the servant who is grabbed. The servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience. Oh, oh. Um, have patience with me. I will pay everything. And out of, um, okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm in the wrong place. So that, that's, that's, that's what the one servant said to the king. So the king lets him go. Uh, the, the other, the other, uh, the other servant says, he goes and chokes the guy and he says, pay what you owe. His fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, I will pay you. So he says the exact same thing that the other servant says, and he refused and went out and put him in, in prison until he should pay the debt. So that's unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is when someone has a genuine heart, has a genuine change of heart, repents or, or 
confesses his sin and wants to make it right, and you say, no. That's the kind of unforgiveness that the Lord's Prayer is warning us against. Okay? Any other thoughts or comments? We don't have time to go to the rest. The other couple things I, I want to say is that forgiveness does not remove consequence, nor does it um, uh, um, imply a lack of, 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 of change in position. So, for example, someone in church is caught stealing from the coffers, for example, and he's legitimately... Uh, confesses his sin, he needs to pay it back. <laughs> he needs to pay it back. And that doesn't mean because that doesn't mean because we forgive him, okay, we give him the position of treasurer again. Okay. Um, there are specific qualifications in First Timothy 3 concerning leaders. And so uh, we don't have time to go there. But but forgiveness does not does not remove consequence. Okay, people still have consequences for their actions. And we still need to hold people accountable, especially those that have besetting sins that are always coming into their lives. We need to help them. Okay. Um, question. Like for, for church discipline, how, how long does it usually take before you reinstate the person? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's yeah, so, yeah, no. So that's a great question. Um, maybe let's, let's discuss it after the class because because there's different, um, there's different, uh, there's different perspectives. There's different um, types of sin. There's different types of. Um, uh, it depends on whether the person's repentant or not. I, I would say this: if you're looking at leaders concerning church discipline, the qualifications of leaders are very clear in First Timothy three, one to seven, and 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 the overriding. There's a list of characteristics. And the, the umbrella characteristic is blamelessness. Blamelessness in the church and blamelessness in the community. The last characteristic is he must have a good testimony among outsiders, lest he fall into shame, into the snare of the devil. Okay? So, so if you're talking about uh, restoring someone who is in leadership, my response would be as long as it would take until he was blameless in the church, and blameless among, his testimony was blameless among outsiders. That would be my short answer. If it's just someone being brought back into the church who was removed because they were not repentant, it should be immediate. They, they should be brought back into the church. They should be able to, to attend, to fellowship. Um, that's different. But if you're talking about reinstating a leader, uh, uh, I would say until they're blameless. There should be no one able to just bring a charge because the whole point of blamelessness is the leaders in the church a, a, a public charge cannot be brought against them. Not that they're sinless, but they have a reputation where no one can throw, Satan can't throw the darts to attack them in any way. Um, and so I guess that's a short, uh, that's, that's an answer. We can discuss that more. So I guess my answer is, depends. <laughs> um, but but, but, but let, 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 let's bring it back here. Let's bring it back here. I, you know, we, we got a little bit off topic. Um, um, but it was very important because I really want us to see, I really wanted us to see, I really wanted us to see this. I wanted us to see what it means to ask forgiveness of our debts and what it means for us to forgive those around us, okay? Now, what this doesn't mean is that we can't have a, a, a forgiving spirit to those around us or to God, we release someone of a debt. But if you're talking about actual forgiveness, um, so for example, Jesus said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Jesus had a spirit of forgiveness on the cross, right? Did, did God forgive them of that debt of killing the, the, the blessed Savior God of the universe? 
<laughs> no, God, God, they, unless they turned to their sins and put their faith and trust in Jesus, those guards died and they're facing the wrath of God. They were not forgiven. That doesn't mean that Jesus did not have a forgiving spirit. So we can have a forgiving spirit in saying, asking God to forgive them. That's showing mercy and love. But God will not forgive, and we could not technically forgive unless or until they actually confess and ask for the forgiveness. Um, and so this comes back to the definition. The definition I have, the definition I have here for forgiveness is, is, uh, oops. The definition is uh, the releasing of a debt. This can be uh, literal or figurative. And when I say by figurative, mean to say someone, someone, someone steals from you. Um, they confess their sin you, and you forgive them. You forgive them. Now, maybe they still have to have restoration. Maybe they don't. Maybe you forgive them and say, I forgive you of that physical debt. Okay. In fi the financial department, debt forgiveness, it's just like, okay, the debt's gone. We're going to take, we're going to take the expense. The debt is forgiven. Okay. And so even with sin, which is sin, which is not literal. I mean, it is literal, but it's not, you can't touch it. You can't touch sin um nothing is free in the universe okay nothing is free even the forgiveness of uh, the forgiveness that we have in christ is not free it cost someone something it cost jesus christ immensely so so whenever there is forgiveness there is always a cost there is always a cost involved uh, nothing is truly free in the universe uh, unless God create, creates it <laughs> ex nihilo, out of nothing. Um, so let me just, uh, I just want you to think about that. Um, let, let, let's go ahead, let, let, let's just, what, what time is it right now, Beth? Okay, let's finish now. I just want to, 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 to draw this to a close. We'll be done with the Lord's Prayer. Um, uh, actually, I'm going to go to my other handout and just, uh, and just let's, 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 let's conclude here. Um, So what you pretty much have here, can everyone see that pretty clearly? You have, you have eight different statements in the Lord's Prayer, okay? Eight diff different statements, all right? I'm just going to bring it over here. We, we talked about lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, from the evil one last week. And as I like, I like what Grace said, the, uh, the first three focus on God, and so... If, if you can see here, I have, I have the, the first three here. Asking God to exalt his name, the name of his son. Ask God to bring about the consummation of all things. Ask God for his will to be done. Not ours, not that we, 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 we can't, but our will should be in line with his. Um, and then the, the next three um, are to uh, uh, focus on us. And, and we could also include here, I just wrote this quickly, but um, we can also uh, – so we're asking for forgiveness, but we're also confessing. When we ask for forgiveness, confession is implied. Repentance is implied. Okay? Very important. Very important. And then we ask, uh, we ask for him to lead us into his kingdom. And, and there's a whole theme of being brought into the kingdom of God to protect us from Satan. And then number four, the last, what Bethany said, she stole my thunder, is it comes back to, it comes back to uh, glory, honor, power, kingdom to God the Father and the Son. And I do want to make a note here because there isn't, again, a reference to the Son. But if you look here, this, this uh, 
for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay. That's a doxology. And the reason why we can also include the son in, in part in this prayer and also the spirit is that, is that um, the rest of the New Testament has doxologies just like this being directly attributed to Jesus. So one example is Revelation 1.6. We won't go there, but um, it's, it's a doxology just like it would be given to the Father and it's given directly to, to Jesus Christ. And so it is appropriate for this doxology to be given to, 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 to the Father. Uh, of course, uh, um, no doubt the disciples practiced this prayer just to the Father. Post, post resurrection, post exaltation, guarantee you, post exaltation, post resurrection, they were praying this also to Jesus, um, meaning to say, giving him reverence, asking for asking um, for his name to be exalted as well. Okay, and this doesn't. This we're not confusing the function of the Father and the Son, but we're we're in, we're including the Son in as as part of as part of this prayer. Okay, and then lastly, I just have a a, a quick picture for us. A quick picture for us. We briefly touched on this picture. Last time I made it a little bit neater. Uh, for those who are mathematicians, uh, Kuya Danny, Kuya Danny, it seems to... <laughs> 3D. This is XYZ plane, just for you, Kuya, just for you, XYZ plane. Um, uh, I'm, I'm asking for a multi dimensional prayer life for us. The multi dimensional prayer life is exaltation of the name of the Father, the Son. Request for us, uh, a request for the Father to bring the consummation of all things, the, uh, the request for the Father's will to be accomplished, the request for our daily needs, confession of sin, and request for forgiveness, and also request for us to be led into his kingdom and to be protected from Satan. And then, under all this is this glory be to God, uh, this doxology at the top. All of this should be doxological. So I'm doing a little bit of, of adding stuff here, uh, but I think very appropriate. And so this is the type of, this is the, the, the prayer life that I want us all to have, to be engaged in um, as, we, as we pray the Lord's Prayer, as a pattern. Remember, it's a pattern, okay? So you can pray it literally if your heart is there. Um, I hope that these, these, uh, these, this content and also uh, the trajectories I've given to you will allow you to, to go off in different, in uh, different directions to pray. Uh, I really hope that we can move beyond just praying our requests. We should be praying our requests, but uh, I really like what Ati, Ati Grace said, that, that um, uh, we need to get in line with the agenda of God and his son. We need to be praying their agenda. Um, what's on the agenda for our prayer life? God's agenda, okay? So um, any comments or questions? If you have to go, we're late. I'll let you leave. If you want to stay and talk and ask, discuss further, um, I'm here. I'm not going to go anywhere. So, um, Bethany was asking to copy. So, any comments or thoughts? Tim? Yes. A thought. Like, there's, a, I, I hear, I read about different books regarding forgiveness, no? And, when it comes to forgiveness, even if the person does not, they say, that even if the person is not willing to, for, to ask for forgiveness, you, you yourself, if you have the spirit of forgiveness, you can forgive that forgiveness to the person out of, I don't I think 